Thank you very much to the organizers, to Lorenzo and other organizers for inviting me. Um, uh, I am, uh, uh, as you know from the introduction, a linguist as well as philosopher, a philosopher, so I hope to present today more philosophical aspects uh, of my work to you. Hopefully, they, uh, some of them will interest you. Um, before, I, before I start, let me just say that my talk uh, is uh, uh, going to be uh, on my academia site from tomorrow. So if you want to go through it again at your pace or check the references to, to the corresponding uh, article, then, then you are very welcome. Now, my connection is pretty poor. Uh, I'm glad you can hear me. I can see you perfectly, but I hear every other sentence. So we may have to resort to uh, questions being typed. We'll see how it goes after I finish. But but uh, if, if you don't hear me, please shout, either interrupt me or put your hand up or, 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 or chat um, because I, I just want to know if, if the problem uh, persists and is on your side as well. Okay, so I'll share the screen now. Is everything still okay? Can you hear me? Okay, yes. brilliant, brilliant. Um, Okay, slide show from beginning and I need uh, I need my Okay, I have my pen. Good. Um so um I can I can start now. Um, so, as I said, um, I'm, I'm a linguist as well as a philosopher, so I'm interested uh, in, uh, in this project. I have, uh, as you heard as well, several projects. One of them is the theory of default semantics, but that will be a topic for a, for a separate, more linguistically, linguistically talk. I'll just touch upon it today. But in this, this project, which has been going on for a while, some of you may know my uh, 2009 book representing uh, time, um, I'm interested in connections between um, how we represent time in natural languages, how we speak about language, uh, about time in languages, then what, the, what it tells us about the human concept of time, and then this homo, homo, human concept of time, which we can glean uh, through we can um, get at through the, the, the linguistic expression of, expressions of time, I want to see how it relates to real time, that is, that, uh, whether that helps us to reconcile uh, uh, some uh, incompatibilities uh, in our understanding uh, of uh, both. Um, so, um, that it, it might be worth Remembering these terms from the beginning, I'm going to talk about time M, uh, metaphysical time, so real time, then uh, time with an index E will be for epistemological time, so that's human time, and you'll see why epistemological in due course, and finally linguistic time, uh, time L, and that it's worth remembering that's not tense, it's time, it's temporal reference uh, in uh, this course. Um, Okay, let me just organize my slides so that I could see them all. See them all. Um, the structure of my talk is going to be as follows. So there will be three parts. In the first part, um, I'm going to look uh, at uh, um, the relation between static uh, time M and what we perceive or experience or feel, whatever, as a dynamic uh, time E, because of course, depending on the orientation, some people say you experience time, feel time, some say that no, you experience something else, some say we represent time, some that we don't, so here one have to, has to be careful. Anyway, a dynamic is here with um, an asterisk, because um, you will see by the end of this talk that there is a, a lot to say about this dynamicity, and in the end, it sort of pretty much disappears. So as I progress, the title says from semantics to metaphysics, but I'm actually going to start with metaphysics so that you could see by the end how semantics uh, can explain certain questions in the domains of epistemology and uh, metaphysics. So in the process, I'm going to um, help myself to some uh, interesting ideas by other people so as not to re reinvent the wheel, which will provide the, the background for uh, um, my 
later accounts of first I'm going to talk about indexicality of time and of the ego and of and emergentism. Um, then in the second part, um, I'll talk about our understanding of a real time using the idea of meta representation. And finally, I'm going to tackle this dynamic asterisk time E, remember that's the epistemological time, the, the concept, the, the human time uh, in order to, um, um, to understand it's uh, on the level of concepts. And for that, uh, I'm going to uh, look uh, at uh, time in natural languages as uh, an explanance. So we'll see by the end that the human complex concept of time, it will be very important that it's a complex concept, uh, will have static uh, building blocks. Okay, so part one, uh, my time. Um, one of my favorite, uh, uh, my favorite mottos here from Flaherty. Um, as I said, here there is, there is uh, plenty of fantastic literature, wonderful literature. For example, uh, Jenan uh, Ismail's How Physics Makes Us Free. If you don't know it, I recommend it wholeheartedly. Um, I use it to focus on the, my assumption that we, we have to talk not only about the indexicality of time here, but also indexicality of the thinking agent, the I, uh, or as Ismail says, the micro laws create the space for emergent systems with robust capabilities for self-governance, or self-governance involves the creation of an internal point of view on the world. Um, and so it opens up the psychological space for the growth of the self. So in other words, she's trying to reconcile the, uh, the level uh, of micro laws of physics where time is static with the emergent uh, reality of us humans saying that these can be rec reconciled. So that, that's pretty well, well worked out in the literature in, in philosophy. Another source here would be Craig uh, Callender, uh, What Makes Time Special, uh, his, his book here, which again was worth, worth reading, um, who simply says that flowing time is the most sensible explanation of reality that humans uh, came up with. I quote here, time is that direction on the manifold of events in which we can tell the strongest or most informative stories. So basically time appears to be dynamic because I make sense of static time in that way. And as such, it is dynamic when it's subsumed under the first uh, person uh, indexical. Now, when you look at time in this way, then there are some um, interesting characteristic of first person perspective, which also begin to apply to time, uh, such as immunity to error from identification. Um, what it means uh, is this, that uh, um, for those, of, I, I'm going to, so I'm not trying to be patronizing, but I'm just, to, for those of you who don't know the ideas, because I know this and it is an interdisciplinary conference, I'm going to uh, present them briefly. So, okay, when I, um, uh, when I think of myself um, and I, I think I have a headache or I have a toothache, then I can't be wrong. I can't be wrong because it, it has to be my toothache, my headache. So this is uh, immunity uh, to error through misidentification of me as someone else. But when I look at the, uh, myself in the mirror and uh, uh, I think to myself, I'm wearing a red dress, then this thought is not immune because uh, this may be uh, unbeknownst to me, this may be a uh, clear glass and there's somebody on the other side uh, who looks like me from a distance and is, is wearing a red, um, a red uh, dress while I'm wearing my uh, green uh, jumper. So this kind of belief about the self uh, is not uh, immune. In other words, here, uh, one can entertain thoughts about oneself from an internal or from an external perspective. And this internal perspective, as François Recanati says, uh, has this property of immunity. And now, um, th this is when you think of linguistic examples, it's like uh, in English, remembering doing something uh, as opposed to remembering that I've done it. 
So um, arguably the latter, this one is open to uh, misidentification. I may remember that I recommended a holiday uh, to Italy, whereas it was actually my husband who did it, but remembering doing something is somewhat uh, different. Uh, so now what's interesting is that analogous to the first person beliefs, time beliefs can be immune to error from misidentification as present, past or future, or they can lack this immunity. So we can have not only this indexing after this, under the self, but also uh, interesting uh, characteristics, similar characteristics, which you'll see later will allow me uh, to propose a semantic uh, representation. This is what I call the double uh, indexicality of time. We have the external perspective. Uh, so for example, um, my driving test is, is long in the past. I passed it long, long time ago. Um, but then if I have a dream or a nightmare that I have to take my test, I wake up and strongly believe that uh, I haven't yet passed it, it's still in the future, then I have this internal perspective, which shows us that an event is externally, uh, which I call covertly, that will be important later, in the past and internally, overtly in the future. So that's common sense, we all experience that, but I think it's, it's going to be very important for, uh, for the uh, semantic representation. Okay, so that's my meta-indexing to the uh, ego. Um, now, um, when we talk about time, uh, it's almost impossible not to talk about MacTaggart and his A and B theory. I'm not going to, or even C, uh, C series of time. I'm not going to spend much time on it, just to tell you that according to the a theory, real time flows, there is real past, present and future, or at least some of these are real according to different um, uh, A theorists, whereas in B theory, real time doesn't flow, all there is is relations earlier than later than, but time doesn't flow. Now, some people now propose also C-theory, uh, which is based on MacTaggart C-series, um, according to which uh, time uh, doesn't have a direction. So that will be going even closer to what uh, modern physics tells us. Uh, but what I find interesting is that people actually talk about real time as not flowing, um, and our time as flowing, and they don't um, think about this incongruity very, very much. I think here the onus of proof is on the dissociationist rather than convergentist. So taking time M and time E to be both static or both dynamic preempts the need to explain the incompatibility. So if, if we can um, have a strong argument for static time, then this will be um, sort of a side uh, benefit. In other words, this is what yeah, this is what I mean here. It is, uh, there are two plausible combinations: perspectival dynamic time, transcendental dynamic, and uh, uh, this, of course, uh, physics tells us uh, is not likely. Or we can have perspectival static and transcendental static, um, which, of course, our common sense tells us that is unlikely. But I'll try to show that there is a level at which they are both um, static. Now, first of all, um, is, since I'm uh, appealing here to common sense, let's appeal to common sense and science. It is not unquestionable that we think that time uh, really passes. And why is that? Uh, when you think of our popular knowledge of Einstein's theory and how long it has been around, about a hundred years, um, we have, we as, as, as humans in, in the linguistic societies, in societies, we have increasing awareness of Einstein's theory of special uh, relativity. We have also increasing uh, awareness of uh, people like uh, Carlo Rovelli, whom uh, we, we hope to see soon, um, tells us about uh, static uh, time. So it sort of percolates to, to common awareness more and more day after day. Um, also, we don't really observe any absolute non-diectic direction of time flow. Neither do we observe any absolute non-diectic rate of flow. Um, as we know, the rate is, is quite subjective, how we experience it or feel it. Directions such as the past is behind us, the future is ahead, are culturally imprinted, they vary. Um, so uh, in, uh, in 
plenty of languages, um, in, well, plenty some languages, the future uh, is uh, uh, behind us because we don't see it. The past is in front of us, like in Aymara, in ancient Greek, uh, and in some other languages. So we see the past, but we don't see the future behind. Um, also, as I just mentioned, the experience of the uh, interval is uh, subjective. So this, is, uh, this, this, this also tells us that there is uh, something fishy about how we feel uh, the passing of, of time. Um, okay, so that uh, um, uh, raises some questions such as where exactly does this dynamicity come from and how crucial is dynamicity to human beliefs uh, about time. This slide is going to be important. Um, so this is where we are at the moment. This is, this is my summary where we are now from the ego perspective. So in view of the popular awareness, even if grossly incomplete, because we are not physicists, of the static conception of space-time, I believe that real time doesn't pass. It's a dimension of space time. I also believe that my time, human time passes. I believe that this passage can be objectively measured. And I also believe that the objective measurement of time E can differ from the gauge duration reported by the experiencing subjects. So we want to make sense of all this uh, together. Now, concerning the last point of subjectivity, there is plenty of evidence um, uh, that uh, we uh, experience or feel uh, that a passage uh, or whatever it is that we feel um, uh, differently. For example, Flaherty has lots of empirical evidence for about, from about 700 uh, subjects that um, when the density of experience um, is low, then time passes quickly. Um, um, when the density uh, of uh, experience um, uh, is, is high, then time passes slowly. So for example, when you go on holiday and you do a lot of sightseeing in a day, you, at the end of the day, you wonder, oh, is it, has it only really been one day? So much has happened. So this is, this is documented. Also, there is the so-called kappa effect that um, when the physical distance increases, then the feeling of time increases. Or if you present something to people at certain scale, then that affects the, 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 the experience of time as well. Uh, and of course, emotions uh, and other uh, mental activity. So, um, when you wait for your uh, dental appointment root canal, then uh, of course it drags and then you, you just, until you can, before you can explain, thank goodness it's over. Um, now, okay, so we, where are we now? We are uh, at this meta-indexicality, time E is double indexical, the past, the present and the future are such, not only with respect to the thinking agent as assessed from the external perspective, but also as assessed from Internal perspective. And these two perspectives can come apart, as I, I've just uh, shown you uh, through these um, examples. Um, now, as I said, I'm a philosopher and but also a linguist, uh, mainly semanticist philosopher of language. Um, and uh, I'm interested in representing all this in the sense of semantic conceptual representations. And uh, here, beware philosophers, because I'm not talking about representationalism or non-representationalism about time. I'm talking about representing uh, our concept and thoughts about time. So we are in the level of concepts. Uh, okay, so we, we need an operator, I think, that will capture the relation between time E and time M, because they, this is what we really want to know, how, how it is that uh, there is our time and there is real time. And here, here I started with non-representationalist about time, Giuliano Torengo, uh, who has this idea of a primitive phenomenal modifier. Uh, so this is his um, phenomenal modifier, uh, which is like, a, um, uh, gives us a function uh, from real time uh, to uh, human time. Um, so uh, this is uh, a modifier which gives us like a phenomenon. Um, um, and uh, it is, uh, as I said, primitive phenomenal modifier. I think that the idea of function is 
good. I non-representationalism is interesting, but I'm using this idea for a very different purpose, as you'll see uh, in a moment. But first, let me repeat the slide, which I um, then flagged earlier as important. So let's have a look at it again. So in view of this, our popular awareness of, um, and in view of, you know, popular physics, teaching at school, uh, media, uh, I don't know, scientific American and so on, then uh, uh, in view of popular awareness of the static conception of time, I believe that real time doesn't pass. Uh, our time passes, the passage can be objectively measured, but I also experience that passage uh, differently depending on the occasion. So, um, in order to represent what's going on, because remember, I want to go all the way to uh, the concepts which are conveyed through linguistic expressions in different languages. Um, I'm, I'm using two operators. So it's no longer a phenomenal modifier. It's no longer a primitive. It's this. Uh, we have the here first because they are nested. Okay, we have um, objective covered a qualifier, um, which uh, simply stands for passing time. So that's objective, but it's covered because we don't have online awareness. Where we have online awareness is this here in the subjective um, overt um, uh, experience of time. Um, so we have real time um, in the scope of overt quali qualifier and all this in the scope of the uh, subjective covered qualifier. So to go back, we have, this is, has the widest scope and this has narrower scope, and then we have time M in order to get uh, to time uh, E. And uh, this will be uh, a good starting point for me to build my representation earlier. As I said, uh, they are not phenomenal qualifiers anymore. And why? Because, not because I have a stance on representationalism, I really don't, uh, but uh, it's not my, yeah, it's above my pay grade really, it's not my field, uh, but uh, uh, because, um, as you will see, experience of time may be more complex and the concept of time may be more complex than that. So in fact, the question as such on the level at which I want to be may not uh, arise. So um, in, from now on, I'll be talking about beliefs and concepts, which again is uh, compatible with what Tarango says, uh, but for different reasons. He wants to move to the level of beliefs. Um, I'm not going to talk um, about uh, the sensation of the passage of time much more uh, here. Um, he says that there is no sensation of the passage of time, merely belief. So he has this deflationism. He says that the flow comes from the attitude toward concept, uh, content, but be that as it, as it may, I'm moving to the level of beliefs and associated concepts. Mm, and here, as I said, I'm employing linguistic evidence and linguistic uh, semantic analysis um, uh, of uh, expressions in uh, different languages, because these are the tangible externalizations of these beliefs. I can actually see it, hear it, see it written, hear it said. So that's something tangible, concrete, that we can start with. Um, now, beliefs are good. The level of beliefs is, is good. Um, we represent the world to ourselves and the phenomenal aspect can distort these representations, as we know, but we can also go back and check our representations against new representations and find them uh, wanting. As this, this is if we are on the representation of the story. For example, we can notice temporal compression, protracted duration, which I talked about earlier. Um, and at this point, we form beliefs about the content of our experience. And um, from now on, I'm going to talk about the concept time. In cognitive semantics, it's standard to use uh, capitals, block capitals for concepts. So this will be uh, corresponding to my earlier time E, this will be the concept. Um, of uh, time uh, when you see it on a future uh, slide. Uh, but first this, uh, first let's have a look at this again. So we have my qualifiers, um, we have time M um, and that gives us uh, time E. But how does it help us? We still have this equal sign, which is really not very informative. We still have what people called uh, inherent inconsistency be 
between flow and the lack of flow uh, or apparent inherent, uh, inherent inconsistency, which um, I hope to show that not really um, that uh, uh, that um, obvious. Um, so first I quote from Ismail again, from Jenna Ismail, static versus dynamic. Is it really such a, such a clash? She says this, I quote, the apparent conflict between the familiar flowing time of everyday experience and the static time of the block universe has a stubborn way of reasserting itself as a substantive and all important metaphysical disagreement, even in my own mind. It is a reminder of the constant tension in the human between the transcendent and embedded viewpoints, which is uh, in turn the product of the peculiarly human form of mindedness. So notice constant tension. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, portrayed here as a clash, as something which we have to live with and uh, uh, we have emergent uh, level uh, of uh, uh, complex systems such as humans, but nothing we can do about the clash. Okay, uh, so on this note, I'm moving to the second part of my, of my talk, um, meta-representing. Um, again, as I said, uh, I'm going to adapt here um, some ideas which are useful. Not, not all of this will have to be invented from scratch. Because, for example, Dan Sperber has this brilliant explanation of uh, um, cultural beliefs. He's an anthropologist uh, who um, works uh, on uh, on different uh, explain among other things explanation of cultural beliefs beliefs belonging to different cultures uh, and uh, their rationality so something that may look irrational from the perspective of, of one culture starts be uh, being rational when we see how it is actually believed okay so um, for example uh, when I hear that red giants become white dwarfs. Even if I know some astrophysics, the chance is I don't understand it fully because I don't know enough astrophysics. I know that these are uh, some sort of forms of stars, celestial bodies and so on, but I don't know uh, enough. So for, um, for Sperber, this would be a semi-propositional belief, uh, a belief which is not fully propositional. I read it, I hear about it, I put it in quotes for future understanding, uh, trusting the source, let's say my physics teacher, but not fully understanding it. Um, and for my purpose today, the same happens with time is just a dimension of static space time. Okay, but then when it comes to curved spaces and so on, we don't all understand it to the same degree. And the universe is governed by symmetrical laws. Again, no matter how many times you read Hugh Price uh, or uh, some other books, there is still uh, something uh, which uh, you understand less than people who are experts do. So these are semi-propositional beliefs. They are reflective. They are not intuitive. Um, people are aware of holding them and they hold them in virtue of holding some second order beliefs uh, about them. And they are normally popular representations of scientific representations of reality. Or for him, as I said, what he looked at was, uh, was cultural beliefs, like uh, a tribesman in Ethiopia will tell you, there is a dragon living in the woods, the dragon has a golden heart, go and kill the dragon. And then you understand that there is something there, some danger, but they don't know uh, what it is, so they sort of put it in quotes for future understanding. So this will, this will be very important because this is precisely what happens with the static time, that we try to make sense um, of it uh, in uh, quotes. Uh, so these are these popular assumptions um, um, that embrace basic tenets of special and general relativity, um, and we afford them this semi-propositional meta-representational um, status. This conception of static block universe has such a status as semi-propositional uh, beliefs, representational, not factual, semi-propositional, not uh, propositional. Now, why is it important? When you look when you look at uh, uh, my equations again, we put real time in quotes for future understanding. We know something from popular physics, but not everything that there, there is to be known. Uh, so human 
human time equals real time in quotes. That's, that's okay, according to that theory I just uh, showed you. But then where does it lead us? Um, we know real time doesn't flow. You put this equation, put it in quotes, and our time flows. Um, so again, we are not at the end of the story. This is much worse, isn't it? This is where we are back to that um, uh, quotation from Janan Ismail. Um, so I hope, I hope it is, uh, we can say more um, about uh, human time doesn't flow in order to shed some more, at least a tiny bit more light on what uh, this uh, equation uh, means. And uh, here a nod to the, to the next speaker, that uh, uh, time will emerge from a world without time. And here I, I will wear the hat, a linguist hat, uh, more, uh, more and more as this part three progresses. I'm hoping not to uh, speak for much, uh, much much longer, but I think yeah we have we have time. No pun intended. Um, my assumptions here are going to be these. This is important that forms of temporal reference employed in natural languages uh, give us a window on the human concept of time. Without this, we can't go any further. We have to assume that what we see in in speech, in discourse. Uh, in written language um, uh, actually tells us something about the human time. But uh, we, we can't really assume strong relativity. This would, again, not be very scientific because we know that we all have the same uh, mental architecture and the same uh, kinds of mental operations. Um, so we have to remember this, um, that uh, how we speak about time only tells, ab tells us about this so-called online thinking, not uh, about the ultimate properties of temporal uh, concepts. So this is what Dan Slobin calls thinking for speaking, uh, how we assemble uh, our thoughts for externalizing them in conversation. So there is a link, but there's a, a link that has to be unpacked uh, further. Um, otherwise, as I said, we would be um, relativists. Um, so uh, here, uh, thinking for speaking, or we can also add here, experiencing for thinking. Um, why is that? Because we may experience the same things. We may look at the same objects as, for example, speakers of uh, Yucatec uh, Maya. Um, uh, I'm closer to that area, Mexico, Belize, I hope maybe somebody in the audience actually speaks that language and knows that language. Uh, but um, uh, so, okay, so if we look at a bottle and a, a plank of wood uh, or a pancake, uh, we experience them in Eng uh, speakers of English as bottle, plank or pancake, but speakers of Yucatec Maya will experience them as plastic, wood or maize because they classify, categorize by uh, substance, not by function. So um, this experiencing for thinking uh, will uh, here uh, differ. Um, now, we also have to remember that the concepts we employ in thinking for speaking are often complex. They are not primitive concepts. They are not atomic, subatomic building blocks. So even if, if they are monolexical, even if it's one word, the, they can be, they can have conceptual atoms from which uh, they are, uh, they are built. We don't know the constituency uh, of these complex concepts, but there are various interesting theories. Uh, for example, there's Wierzbicka's natural semantic meta-language, who looked at over a hundred languages and uh, uh, managed to distill um, uh, a few scores of uh, uh, such basic concepts, which are um, building blocks for then uh, concepts, even lexical concepts in different languages. There are some other theories on the market as well, and that goes back to the 1960s to the lexical decomposition. So um, there's plenty of literature on these atoms uh, of meaning, and of course, plenty of opposition like, uh, like Jerry Fodor's. Um, now, um, another thing we have to remember when we look at languages is that not all languages in, um, use the same devices for uh, temporal reference. In some languages, we may have lots of adverbials such as yesterday, now. In others, we may have tenses, aspect, tense, aspect is this internal temporality of the situation 
whether any eventuality is extended in time or not, whether it's completed or not. Um, in other languages, we may have mostly pragmatics, mostly uh, temporal reference left to context. You may not even have grammatical tenses, but context or some kind of defaults, conventions, will tell us whether uh, the speaker meant uh, past, present or future, or even whether the speaker meant remote past uh, or immediate past. And uh, this, is, this is an example I'm going to use here in this talk. Um, as I said, in languages such as English, we have grammatical tenses and grammatical aspect, this sort of internal temporality, extended or not, finished or not. Uh, but there are plenty of languages which are tenseless. So we have, for example, Paraguayan Guarani, Yucatec Maya, Mandarin Chinese. Um, I gave you here a few other examples, the lesser known ones with uh, some explanation of the family and, and, and region. Um, these languages tend to have aspects, so they have this internal temporality, finished, completed or not, and so on. They have mood markers, modality, um, they have evidentiality, which means that um, they will encode in, in, the, in the grammar the source of evidence, whether uh, the state or event was witnessed firsthand or whether it was uh, only heard about secondhand and so on. They may have temporal adverbials, yesterday and so on, uh, or they may mostly rely on pragmatic inference from, from context. Um, or some default interpretations. Um, uh, there will be always la also languages in which tenses are optional, like uh, like Thai. In Thai, both tense and aspect are optional, and quite often uh, the model markers which are used, um, uh, like can, must, uh, give us uh, uh, some strong default interpretations, um, such as th these tend to be about the past default because this is most most certain, concrete, uh, and important, then it moves, um, uh, or, or, yeah, then, or, or then it moves to the present and the future. Sometimes it's the present, if it's depending if it's a state, because it has uh, most uh, uh, highest reference, let's say, to, to, to what we're talking about, to the topic of conversation. Um, anyway, some examples. So in Hausa, for instance, uh, when you, a sentence like this, uh, can be translated as she is or was or, or was or will be playing. And so as you can see, what's foregrounded in the grammar is not really ab uh, absolute tense, when, uh, whether it's it happened, will happen or is happening, but something else, uh, namely the aspect that it's a continuous event, that playing is an extended event uh, through time, whereas the exact temporal location is uh, not uh, uh, not uh, foregrounded uh, at all. Uh, in Yucatec Maya, again, this is quite interesting because uh, again here we have no absolute tense. What we have is um, uh, the marker of whether it's immediate, but it doesn't tell us if it's immediate in the past or immediate relatively in the extended now, present, or immediate future, just immediate, and the incomplete uh, status uh, of uh, the uh, event. Mm, so we have uh, in this sentence, this can mean I have just read a paper, or I had uh, or will have just read the paper. So again, as you see, location, absolute location is not uh, foregrounded. And this is how we get relative tenses, proximate, relative future. So proximate, it tells us that it's, it's not far off from now, uh, but the future will be relative on something else, which happened, will happen, um, or is happening. And the same with uh, some other combinations. These are just some examples of these. Uh, combinations. Now, uh, West Greenlandic, an Eskimo language, similarly, um, we can have, for example, present or past time reference conveyed through factual modes like introducing, presupposing, inquiring, um, and then further disambiguation uh, provided by aspect and by the context, by inference, pragmatic inference from the, from the context. Uh, the future, interestingly, again, is rendered by uh, markers such as be likely or begin, uh, let us, uh, there is no, uh, no future uh, tense. 
So I looked at, at this in detail a few years ago um, um, for my book, Representing Time, uh, 2009 OUP book and some other articles uh, where I concluded, and I had some not only evidence, but theoretical argumentation um, that uh, this tells us that human time is really essentially epistemic a model concept. So it is not the concept of flowing time or temporal location that is foregrounded in languages, but rather some other concepts, such as the status of this eventuality. Eventuality means event or uh, state um, or process. Uh, so status is completed or in progress and the attitudes such as necessity, obligation, wish, um, and the kind of strength of evidence we have about this. Uh, event uh, or um, state. And uh, they are related to temporal reference when we think of time in this meta-indexical way, which I introduced in part one of my talk as inextricably linked to, subsumed under uh, the ego, the self with its attitudes of wishing, wanting, obligation, uh, desire to express the degree of commitment, this is important, based on the source of uh, evidence. Um, so then I came up with this idea of time as graded commitment to events. I'm sure other people came, uh, came up with this as well, but I sort of uh, have commitment to events, but mine was graded commitment where the degree of commitment comes from the linguistic expression plus context. Remember this um, lexicon grammar pragmatics trades off because you can have information not just from what you say, but from the entire uh, situation. And um, then I was also saying that based on all that evidence, we may be able to actually assign degrees of commitment if we had really big corpora. So that's something to do for computational linguistics or maybe for neurosemantics, neuropragmatics. Uh, when we have lots of evidence, we can see how people speak in what context and what it tells us about this degree of commitment. So as such, what I'm saying here is that uh, time is model uh, epistemic. Um, and uh, this, you may, you may remember, I started with time M, time E, time L, and this is, is going to tell us more for, uh, when we start with time L about time uh, E, which then will help us with that equation sign uh, I had before. So this is what it means. Events can be understood or remembered to different degrees. Uh, they can also be anticipated more or less strongly. Inference about events can be monotonic, non-monotonic, and as such can be more or less uh, trustworthy. This is what I call the model supervenience uh, of uh, time or uh, the uh, supervenience of uh, concept of time on the uh, concept of epistemic uh, modality. So the definitional characteristics will be from there. Now, well, when we look at languages and at this strong, strong modality, the fact that time as such doesn't even figure in these sentences which I gave you, then uh, it appears that, the, to me at least, I draw the conclusion from my various arguments that the concept of time rests on building blocks that mark such degrees of epistemic commitment, the degrees to which are prepared to endorse statements about the past, the Future. Okay, so back to my equation. Um, by the way, Giuliano Torengo didn't have any equations. That was earlier on, it was just my, my interpretation of what he's saying about the phenomenal modifier. Uh, so remember, my subjective qualifier objective of time m, uh, real time gives us time e. And remember that I wanted to be on the level of beliefs for good reasons. And now when we are on the level of beliefs, so this is, this is, gives, uh, gives us the, le the level which we are on, um, uh, the index belief, then we get to the concept of time. Remember, block, uh, block capitals mean the concept. So this, on the level of belief, we have the concept of time. Right, and in virtue of what I have just said, uh, I suppose I should probably present it in a flowchart next time. Um, if, um, if uh, or for me, since, uh, the time E is a complex concept, then we want to know its composition. And once we know it, then decomposition of concepts such as past, present, and future uh, will follow uh, from that. Uh, so it looks uh, fairly promising to me. Um, now, 
As I said, we must remember that when we move from natural languages and these different languages, some tense, less, some tense, uh, we must beware that that doesn't lead us to relativity because there is no, uh, uh, no uh, evidence of, uh, of that. Um, so that slide is a reminder here that language diversity doesn't have to lead to the conclusion of linguistic relativity. Uh, that is to a concept of uh, time, human uh, time for language uh, E and L for language X, which is language dependent, because while on the surface languages display significant cross linguistic variation, this variation only reflects complex molecular concepts. Remember, time is a complex concept. It has these uh, model epistemic building blocks. And uh, such complex uh, concepts are composed of universal conceptual building blocks. Uh, so uh, a bit like uh, the, in uh, texts on uh, lexical semantics for undergraduates, you get the concept of a bachelor being um, plus human plus um, male minus married plus adult adults. So these are these conceptual building blocks. So Stephen Levinson um, coined the term neo-worthiness. He looked at spatial reference, but it seems to me that there is no reason why we shouldn't use the same analysis for, uh, for time. And nobody, nobody really has, has done that. So uh, I think uh, if, we, if we accept, actually Levinson doesn't, is not even fully committed to neo-worthiness because he says he finds languages in which you can't translate certain spatial relations um, uh, onto others using these building blocks. So that's still un uh, incomplete. But I'm just putting it here to show you that we does, don't have to be in rel uh, relativists. We can be universalists about human thought on the level of those uh, building blocks. Right, so about time, that uh, tells us that time E revolves around epistemic modality, rests on time E rests on building blocks that mark such degrees of commitment, the degrees to which uh, we are prepared to endorse statements about the past, the present, and the uh, future. Putting it all together, we have the concept of time across three domains, which appears as an emergent property on the higher molecular level of human. Uh, concepts. Um, what time did I start? Can I talk for a few more minutes? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yep. Okay. You there more more if you want. Slides, but I just want to show you this, this picture, how it all uh, gets together. Uh, so putting it together, time doesn't flow on the level of conceptual building blocks but it flows on the level of their molecular combinations, species-specific thoughts, and their culture and language-specific expressions. So now some of you might think I'm just kicking the unknown to a different level. Some of you may think that I'm contributing to the story. I think I'm contributing, but certainly this is still not finished. But uh, uh, what it does allow me to do, wearing my linguist's hat, is go further in the semantics, in my conceptual semantics. Remember, we were here on the level of beliefs, and this is the concept of time. And um, this slide, if you, are, if you are tired by now, look away, make yourself a cup of coffee. But if you hear, want to hear my other story from semantics, then um, bear with me for a minute, and I'll tell you about this slide, really with the speed of light. So now what I, what I do wearing my linguist hat, I unpack this concept as this. So this tells me that uh, um, time, concept, the concept of time is a complex concept which we can further unpack um, as epistemic modality. And again, so as not to reinvent the wheel, uh, I use and uh, misuse uh, Paul Grice's um, operator of acceptability. He had this he wrote a really quite an unknown book, Aspects of Reason, uh, published posthumously, unfinished, in which he tried to bring different kinds of modality, subsume them under one acceptability operator. So he will have, it, it is acceptable that it is the case that P, he is acceptable uh, that let it be that P. I suppose many of you, probably know it in this audience since um, you, you, uh, a lot of you are epistemologists. 
But so yes, he, he talked about um, uh, practical and analytic modality. I'm applying it here uh, to, uh, um, uh, to epistemic, I can apply it to deontic modality as well. But as I say, I use it very differently. First of all, uh, I assign a degree uh, to this acceptability because remember I talked about the degrees of commitment when we talk about the past, the future or now. Within each domain, we have different degrees of commitment. I can say, um, I went to London yesterday, I might, uh, John went to London yesterday, John may have gone, must have gone, and so on. Uh, so there will be different degrees. I need these degrees here. And also, I don't operate on the level of propositions because I want the level of how we speak. I want the level uh, of the main meaning, which I call somewhere as functional proposition. So my sigma stands for so-called merger representation in my default semantics. In fact, Lorenzo asked me to give a talk about that, uh, but since he gave me an option, I decided not to do it. You can invite me again if you want, and I can talk about default semantics, but today it's just, it's just uh, one little slide. Um, so I talk about major representations because I'm more interested um, at the level um, of uh, what we convey in our speech acts. That is, um, we have what we utter in words, but we also have our inferences in context, default meanings. We have the scenario. We have um, uh, defaults like cognitive defaults. And here, my, uh, uh, my background um, uh, in uh, Husserl, where I, I wrote my PhD a long, long time ago on, uh, on, on DFIL, I should say, it, if Oxford people are in the audience on Husserl. Uh, so I use this um, concept of in, in strong and weak intentionality as well. All this, it gives us um, some meaning, which language itself, propositions in sentences won't give us. Sentences give us a bit, which can be then further uh, uh, elaborated on or even overridden if our speech act is indirect. So, okay, so we have, it is acceptable to the degree delta pertaining to a certain linguistic expression in context that it is the case that uh, sigma. This is what it means. So this is where I take it in my linguistic work. Uh, in default semantics, I can also represent then tense time mismatches because notice I'm no longer on the level of sentences. I can use, uh, uh, I can ex explain which uh, uh, formal dynamic semantics uh, theories still don't, um, um, what we convey by I go back to the UK tomorrow. Uh, Oh, I have this as well. Again, look out if you are not interested, but this is just an example of my major representation that uh, I have sources of information. Not all of them are language. C is cog CD cognitive default. Proper names uh, by default uh, come with the strongest intentionality, um, like in Kaplan. Um, so we have this, then we have it is acceptable to the degree pertaining to tenseless future. Tenseless future is go. I go tomorrow, not I will go. Um, and again, the processes uh, from different sources of information, different processes uh, tell us what to do with such a sentence. So this is word meaning sentence structure, this is conscious pragmatic inference about primary meaning and so on. So just a taster, if you are interested, that's a subject for another talk. And really, really um, another uh, slide uh, to give you a bigger picture where it leads. Today I presented this. Today I presented uh, this um, sort of reduction or uh, connection. Uh, I started with time in metaphysics and epistemology and then try to shed some light from language in order to go back through these to real time, uh, how we can uh, draw this uh, equation. But I also have a story on this level, as well as stories about so-called vertical reduction. So this is the bigger picture of what I was talking today, as well as, as, as this. Uh, and you can read about it in my uh, other paper. So this is my really, really final slide, summing up. Time flows on the emergent level of the ego perspective, and this flow is explained through a combination of interrelated explanantia. Uh, we have this emergent meta-indexical ego perspective I talked about with the help of brilliant philosophers uh, such, such as um, Jenan Ismail. 
here I talked about these different, remember my, my qualifiers, subjective and objective, as well as this immunity to error for misidentification. Um, then I talked about meta-representing. Remember, putting real time in quotes for future understanding, um, as, uh, as we do in, popular, uh, in, in reading popular science uh, texts. And finally, in the third part, I moved to the concept of time uh, and to uh, its realization, externalization in different languages in order to shed more light on this, uh, so to speak, dynamic uh, time, um, which um, we saw as a uh, as clashing with static time. And uh, I argued here that this is reanalyzable into static conceptual building blocks pertaining to degrees of epistemic commitment. Um, I admit I cut that short because this is a longer, a, 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 an older story. So if you have any questions, then uh, do ask. That's all. My talk is going to be on my academia side from tomorrow. There are, there are references to the entire article, um, so uh, you are welcome to have a look at that. Other than that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Kasia, for your very interesting talk. Um, now is the time for question and answer. I repeat the main rules. Please, who wants to make a question? Please write to me privately, privately in the chat. So to Lorenzo Boccafogli, just write question or Q. And this way I will have an order, chronological order to make the questions. Uh, it's uh, 10, 23, we have about 40 minutes question and answers. And then we will begin with, uh, uh, with the talk of Professor Rovelli. Uh, thank you very much, Kashi, also for accepting the change of the slot. It was a great help for us. Thank you very much. And then, uh, yeah, write me a, a simply Q, and then we'll go on uh, chronological with the question you're proposing to me. Uh, proposing to Kashi, actually, not to me. <laughs> uh, in the case Kashi can't hear, good. Can you hear me good right now? It's still, I can hear less than a half. So if Less it's, than a half it, is a problem. Of, it's, it's, it's really breaking, breaking up every other sentence. So you can try, but if, if I don't hear, then you have to write it. I'm sorry, but this, yes, yes, not, yes, yes, I understand. Work. I don't know why this one doesn't. Okay, we will do this way. I will give the word to the to the present people for the question. If you don't hear the question, um, please write down the question so Kasia can read it. Write down it in the public chat so Kasia can read it and answer vocally. Okay, that would, um, I think, the best uh, the best solution to the uh, connection problem that we have. Okay. Uh, the first one is from Professor Tim Williamson. To you, the word, Professor Williamson. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, and and, and thanks, Kasia, for the that interesting talk. Um, I want to ask about something that came in at, at the beginning and at the end, which was immunity to error through misidentification. Um, I'm wondering how useful it is for you, because, um, I mean, you gave the example of I have a headache um, as as something that might be immune to error through misidentification. But um, it, that, that it, it's perfectly possible to make that judgment and as a result of an error of misidentification. I'm not hearing at this point, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I can guess what you're going to say, but I don't hear anymore. <laughs> yes, so can you hear me now? <laughs> I don't hear. Please type it. Oh, it, it'll take a long time, but I can... Um, uh, we had this problem, connection problem with Kasia. If it would be possible for you, uh, Professor Williamson, to write down a little bit your question, maybe yes, in a synthetic it, it, way, is the, maybe the only way we have to communicate now. She yeah, can read, Kasia can read it and then answer, answer vocally, of course. I'm quite a quite slow typist. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. So uh, I am immune to... I'm sorry, I, I, um, I have a headache. No, no, I don't hear. Please type. Okay. 
just type. And yeah. can I just say, other people, if you have questions, start typing or something. Be yes. it was, but I, it's really breaking up. Breaking up. Lorenzo, if if someone else has a, a really short question, it would be better for them to ask it. Straight okay. Up. So let's go on with your question. When you're ready, please, uh, Mr. Williamson, um, tell me directly, and then you will have the word another time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you have the time to type to type to type the question. Yeah. The second question we have is from uh, Professor Carlo Rovelli. Carlo Rovelli, you have the word. Please uh, write down your question because Cash has some problems in connecting with the audio. I was. I, I was writing down, uh, so Perfect. it will take me a minute. Uh, okay, Kasia, are, you, okay. are, you li are, are you hearing me or, or not at all? I can, but in a couple of seconds I won't, so it's, there's no point starting a discussion. I think just, just type, please. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I don't know why the connection Okay, is. okay, okay. So, Lorenzo, uh, Please go ahead because it will take take a moment okay. for me to, to to write it down. Go ahead and, and then whenever you want. I hear you perfectly, I'll... but Kasia doesn't. So please write. Yeah, I send you I send you the the, the, the mail the the, the the chat message to you, uh, and when you see it, you can read it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Then let's see who has a short question. Uh, I have in the order Edna Miranda. Uh, Edna Miranda wrote down. Uh, type this question. I can copy this and put it in uh, and put it in the uh, common chat. Uh, or, or please, Aidan, uh, put it uh, publicly in the public chat for everybody. Aidan, you hear me? Yes. Yes. So make please the question in the public chat so Kasia can read it. Yes. Can we connect it with the concept of Lebensfeld in Husserl's phenomenology? Um, um, what, what, what do you mean it? If it's time E, then certainly yes. Yes, we, we can. Um, it's yes i mean it's the role of ego is, is it's quite it's it's commonsensical you simply um you, you can think of of human time uh, in uh, Husserl's way of internal time consciousness, you can think of it in uh, like uh, in MacTaggart uh, that um, we have uh, experiences, we have memories of uh, of experiences, and we have uh, anticipations. Um, uh, you can think of here, of course, about uh, human time in terms of Heidegger uh, and 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 his Sein und Zeit, and why is is time. Uh, uh, final for us why uh, it flows and begins and and ends so yes the answer is is yes um, uh, as i said i'm influenced by uh, sort of uh, behind the scenes i'm influenced by who sells who sell in many ways when even when you go to my um, default semantics um, then uh, um, when I look for, for those conceptual building blocks, which I realized in languages, um, I don't look at the sentence, but look at the main speech act. So sometimes I will take the proposition of the sentence as it is. Sometimes we may have to extend it. So I say, I, I haven't eaten, of course, it'd be I haven't eaten breakfast today, not I haven't eaten ever. At other times, times I will go on the level of sigma uh, to you know, something else altogether. So I'm sort of uh, digressing a bit just to say something else about Husserl now. Um, where by haven't eaten, I may mean, please, uh, let's go to a restaurant. Um, so on this level, I use Husserl in yet another way because uh, I use uh, strength of intentionality uh, of underlying mental states that sometimes we know about how to interpret the sentence uh, because a sentence will have several readings uh, and one of them will come with the strongest intentionality. Um, so yes, but I'm, I, th there are many influences from Husserl in my uh, work, which uh, 
yeah, it wasn't easy when I was doing my DFL, but not, not many people in the UK then talked about, about Husserl. And just to give you, um, it was long, long time ago. And uh, uh, what saved me is Michael Dammett then wrote a book on Husserl and other philosophers. So uh, people read that book. So people started believing that even a PhD student that maybe there's something in it. Okay, so uh, Tim Williamson, uh, I have a headache, it's not immune. I can judge it on the basis of misidentifying someone in the mirror as me who might take a headache uh, uh, what makes judgment is just it is not based on identity premise yes it's it's absolutely it's absolutely fine um, I have to share uh, my screen here um, so when I talked about it, it was, was somewhere somewhere around here uh, uh, excuse me, Kasia, if I interrupt, I just wanted to read the question of Professor Williamson completely. I don't hear you. Okay. So, what uh, happened? One, 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 one moment. I write down the question. I, 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 I will read the question, sorry. I'll read the question of Professor Williamson. Oh, no, no, I, I read it. Okay, but maybe... Uh, maybe some people didn't understand it right. Just a second. I have a headache. It's not I E M. I can judge it on the basis of misidentifying someone in the mirror as me, whom I take to have a headache expression on their face. What makes a judgment I E M? I E M is just that it is not based on an identity premise, contrary to Schumacher. The same goes for temporal judgment. The same goes for uh, temporal judgment. Um, even judgments involving non-indexical terms can be IEM if not based on an identity premise. So please. Um, yeah, I was trying to share, share the screen, but for some reason it won't, won't go up or down. I don't know why it doesn't let me share. Anyway, um, I, I absolutely agree. That's why uh, I ap appealed there to Recanati's distinction about um, uh, externally this uh, and inherently internally this uh, beliefs. So that will distinguish between these two situations, whether um, you are uh, thinking externally of yourself as self or you just you have this belief. So that's, that's his uh, uh, inherently and externally uh, this. Uh, I don't think you object to that then. It would be just simply drawing the boundary rather than by what linguistically you call a scenario or uh, through something else like different cases um, uh, of uh, or different sort of sources of this belief about the self. This internal external may not be the easiest uh, term terminology but, but but this is what it is if, if you if you're thinking about yourself or not thinking about yourself just experiencing. Does that provide an answer? I, I don't think so. It's not how you're thinking of yourself. It's what the oh, epistemic I basis of the, of the judgment is. I, well, I don't hear you, which is horrible okay. at the yeah. conference not to hear the question, but um, I think I can... All I can say that uh, I'm aware that not, not everybody agrees that there are um, beliefs that are immune to misidentification. But even if you, if you take that perspective, uh, it doesn't matter because what, I, what matters for my argument is actually this lack of immunity. Because remember what I used is this lack of immunity where I can believe that my driving test hasn't happened. And this is what I use for my operators of objective and subjective. But as to inherently, inherently uh, um, b b beliefs which are immune to identification, 
I had a chat with a typologist, which was really revealing linguistic typologist who says that this is, this is actually represent some languages, there are some languages which make overtly the distinction between beliefs um, which, are, which are me, as if looking at myself from the inside, whereas uh, beliefs that are me, but looking at myself from the inside. So there is, there is something in it. Uh, let me just read your question again. Uh, it's not how you think of the referent in the belief, it's where the belief comes from. Uh, yeah, 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 okay. So that's, that's exactly, we agree on that. We agree on that. Um, you are so satisfied? So we read, it's okay? Yes, let, let's go to, to uh, Professor Rovelli's question. <laughs> So what's happening, Lorenzo? Do you want to read it or shall I read the question yes, or just... Yes, I read it. From Carlo Rovelli. Interesting talk. Apologies for joining late. Super Amazing. interesting talk. Apologize for joining late. Missing the beginning. A lot to learn for me. I appreciated especially your articulated relation between beliefs and concepts and your talk on semi-propositional beliefs which I think may clarify much confusion about misunderstanding between physics and popularization. As a mm. physicist, who is sometimes quoted saying the time does not exist, I would mm. like to say that I think the time flows for me and also flows in nature. The naive static block universe picture is a misunderstanding. There is nothing static in nature. The point is only the complexity of the notion of time both in your thinking and the concept needed to make sense of nature. A lot to learn for me, so it was the correction. So she has some comment about what Carlo Rovelli says. Uh, can I answer now? Okay, uh, Carlo, if I may, if I may, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm not a physicist, although there was a time in my uh, distant past when I really, really wanted to be. Um, but I understand, I, I understand that, that this is precisely the case, that you can have different, different pictures of reality depending on where you stand, uh, and nothing is static. So, and you also have uh, now people, what also puzzles me that philosophers are often, uh, about philosophers of time divide themselves into A theorists and B theorists. So either time flows or time doesn't flow, but nobody really looks at McTaggart's C series according to which um, there is no arrow. So you basically have events, uh, but no arrow. Um, and uh, that, that seems to me interesting because then you leave it to physicists from which which direction you look at the universe? What does it mean that we can exist only with some universes, not in others, depending on uh, on entropy? What would it mean to entro for entropy to go the other way? And all these fascinating things. There's nothing static about it. Uh, and uh, this is as much as I say because yeah. I learned a lot about these things from your book. I learned a lot from uh, your your talk in Cambridge uh, as well. I was there, uh, and yeah, I'm glad that uh, you find this uh, as a bit of a bridge because that was the intention: uh, a bridge uh, between what physicists tell us, a bridge uh, philosophers, and then on the other hand, what philosophers tell us and what linguists actually see in how we how we speak about time and how we speak is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Professor Rovelli, are you satisfied with the answer? Yes. Perfect. So, uh, just a moment. I add in my order a question from Professor Graham Priest, but uh, uh, we need actually the typed version. I don't know if uh, he has it, or should we go on okay. with Santiago Nunez Corrales? No, no, I have it. Uh, let me just paste it into the chat column. Okay, so may we say that 
the way languages seem to encode time facilitate remapping okay. the past to simulate in the future by compressing it across syntactic and semantic dimensions. So from Santiago Nunes Corrales, may we say that the way languages seem to encode time facilitate reenacting the past or simulating the future by compressing it across syntactic and semantic dimensions, given that our brains possess the facility of simulation to a great extent, being there for a sort of power heuristics to cope with the conflict of the world. Um, this is, can I answer now? Okay, so this is, uh, yeah, Santiago, yeah, hello, can I see you, first of all? Uh, it's like to, uh, it's good to be able to see the person you reply to, but, oh, okay, hello. Um, it's, it's a very complex question, um, because, well, first of all, Simulate simulation theory. I always find it a little bit fishy, but there is something in it. But what I would like to say that simulation has to rely on what meaning is for humans. And what we know about meaning is that there aren't, there isn't any meaning that is represented somewhere uh, in us, whether we are Denetian or not, there is no mean, meaning sitting in us. We have memories of how language was used in the past, but these memories don't lead to abstraction. This seems to be a more and more uh, widely shared view, which I subscribe to, that you don't have an abstraction of meaning. This abstraction from past uses comes together with uh, what Recanati again is called cos cos modulation uh, or um, some modification. So basically this is where he ends up with this, this late Wittgensteinian picture of meaning that um, what we what we have is uses which are informed by past uses but no core. Um, so whatever language then gives us um, syntactic and semantic dimensions will have to be in, include the pragmatic dimension, include the fact that uh, it's, you know, it's all dynamic. We don't recreate anything. It's we, uh, semantic syntax pragmatics have to be dynamic. We go to a certain point and at that point where we are, everything we've experienced so far gets um, not only summed up, uh, and uh, it gives us an abstraction, but it gets changed and changed and changed. Does it answer the question? I just sort of, do I waffle? But that's, that's how I see it. Thank you so much. Yes, it provides perspective into what I'm trying to get at. Hey, Kasia, you can go on with a question from Professor Priest. I write to you right now. I hope you read the next one. I, I'm having trouble even seeing things now. Let me just Can move. you see the question of Professor Priest? I've written to you this. I'm trying to, I'm trying to see other questions. It's sort of Santiago yeah, yeah. you can see. 
maybe say that, okay. Maybe say that the way language is, no, that, that I've answered. Do you see my ones? I see Graham. I can't yes. say that I followed all the details to get clearer. Let me ask a simple question. I sit in my chair in New York. I just sit here. Phenomenologically, there appears to be no change of place, but there appears to be a change of time. What explains the difference? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> okay, so, so, so I, I hope there isn't any difference. Um, uh, I, I hope that the, the way I see it, right, we, we know that uh, uh, you sit in your chair, space uh, doesn't move. You sit, uh, uh, when you're on a cruise, you sit in your chair, and then the bank of the river or whatever the, 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 the space moves. It's much easier to think of space as not moving and it's much more difficult to think of, of time as not moving. But is it a quantitative difference or is it a qualitative difference? Um, or is it just, if it's qualitative, is it just this Heideggerian difference that it's because we, uh, our time is limited, we are born and we die and we know about it? What if we, uh, if our science progresses and uh, um, uh, we know more about what we turn into, uh, we will have a different perspective? I don't know, but I have this from my, from the way I look at it, um, it seems to me that uh, a lot of it will be quantitative, that uh, you, can, you can see space moving. Um, and sometimes you wonder, am I moving, is space moving? Or, or am I, is it just, a, uh, or am I just dizzy and so on? So it's not, not that, 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 that very much different. And we look at metaphors. When you look at metaphors, we conceptualize um, uh, time in terms of space. Uh, space quite often. Christmas is coming, we are approaching uh, uh, the summer and so on. But uh, there are also opposite conceptualizations. And when you look at uh, um, uh, other species, when you look at, can't remember which one they were, I think vervet monkeys, uh, that uh, conceptualize space in terms of time because um, when there is a predator coming, then they will allegedly think, how long will it take me to hide behind that bush from a predator? So they estimate distance in terms of space. So it's, it's really, there is a lot of, uh, uh, there are the, the partial sort of argumentation reasons to think of them as, as, as uh, quantitative differences. Now, Professor Priest, okay. I hope Professor Priest, I don't know if Professor Priest is satisfied with the answer. Um, I don't feel as though the question was really addressed, but under these conditions, it's rather difficult to carry on a, a philosophical conversation. So let's, let's go on. You're right, it's quite, it's quite difficult. It's quite difficult. Okay. Since we have no other question, it's 10 minutes before 11. So, I would like to thank very much another time, Katarzyna Jaszczyk. I Sorry, I can, I, can, I can see that question. I can, I can just about answer the last question. I can't say that I followed. Oh, no, no, it was the last question. Okay. Yeah, it was the last one. It was the last one. Oh, I, I apologize for the connection. It's, it couldn't help. I mean, philosophy conference is one kind of conference you have to talk. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it's complicated.